Hello again, everyone. This is our science teacher, Tim Martin, and in Meteorology Part 16, we'll start a short series about severe weather. This video will focus on hurricanes. Hurricanes, or severe tropical cyclones, are often referred to as the most destructive weather on Earth. Let's take a look at how they form and how they develop. Looking back to 2017, Hurricane Irma was a notable storm. It started out in late August as a series of thunderstorms in the eastern Atlantic. It gradually became more organized into a tropical storm, and then on the 1st of September 2017, it became a hurricane. As it made its way across the central Atlantic Ocean, it gradually built in strength. It eventually became a strong Category 5 hurricane. By the 5th of September, it approached the Windward Islands of the Caribbean. By the 6th of September, it started to strongly affect the United States island of Puerto Rico. It passed just north of the island of Hispaniola and brushed the northern coast of Cuba before crossing the Florida Keys. Making its way into the Gulf of Mexico, it eventually hit the U.S. mainland on the Florida Gulf Coast on September 11, 2017. It dissipated a day later, September 12, as a tropical storm over the southeastern United States. So how do these storms form, and where do they gather their energy? Let's take a look. For starters, hurricanes are tropical cyclones with winds that are greater than 65 knots. That's 74 miles an hour, or 120 kilometers an hour. If they occur in the Indian Ocean, they're referred to as tropical cyclones. If they form near or affect the western Pacific, we refer to them as typhoons. However, if they're in the Atlantic Basin or in the eastern Pacific, they're referred to as hurricanes. They're all the same basic storm. Different years have different quantities of hurricanes. This is a map of 2017 showing all the hurricanes that occur affected the northern Atlantic Basin. That was a fairly normal year. If we go back to 2015, we see a very light hurricane year, with only a few storms that actually attained hurricane intensity. On the other hand, back in 2005, the story looked quite different, with over 28 named storms, many of them severe, affecting much of the Caribbean and the United States. If we take a longer look, about 60 years worth of hurricane data is represented on this map. We see some interesting patterns. There are hurricanes in the North Atlantic and in both Eastern and Western Pacific, some in the South Pacific, and a few in the Indian Ocean. You'll notice that there's only been one hurricane in this time period to affect the South Atlantic Ocean. You'll notice that there are more stronger storms in the Western Pacific. One other obvious thing to note is that there are no hurricanes near the equator. With a few degrees north and a few degrees south of the equator, we don't see any hurricanes because hurricanes are rotating cyclones. The reason for the rotation is the Coriolis effect. We can see in these two images, a northern hemisphere storm on the left rotates counterclockwise. In the southern hemisphere, storms rotate in a clockwise pattern. At the equator, there is no Coriolis effect, so you do not get rotating storms there. So let's talk about how hurricanes form. In order for hurricanes to form, we need air moving over warm ocean water. Generally, that's above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. When the air moves over the warm ocean water, it picks up water vapor. The water vapor and warm air rise. As the air rises, further away from the surface of the Earth, condensation begins when the air starts to cool. Keep in mind, the process of going from water vapor to liquid means latent heat will re be released. As latent heat is released, the air is rewarmed, causing further rising air. As more air rises, this causes more surface wind to come in to replace that rising air. Thus, the hurricane feeds itself through the process of condensation and rising air. Initially, a hurricane may start out as what we discuss as a tropical disturbance. This is a grouping of thunderstorms, not necessarily very organized. 
After the period of a few days, we may see some organization develop. The storms will start to take a circular structure, and they may have consistent winds up to 38 miles an hour. After the organized storm reaches wind speeds above 39 miles an hour, it is now called a tropical storm. This is when a name is given to the storm. If the storm then passes 74 miles an hour in wind speed, it becomes a hurricane. Here's a close-up view of Hurricane Irma from 2017. Let's cut it apart and look at what's on the inside. To understand the hurricane structure, it's helpful to look at some of the parts. The eye wall is towards the center of the storm. This is where the strongest thunderstorms and the strongest winds occur. The eye wall surrounds the eye. The eye is a region of calm descending air, frequently cloud-free. Not all hurricanes have eyes, but stronger ones frequently do. Surrounding the eye and eye wall are rain bands. These are organized thunderstorms that are spiraling inwards towards the center. Along with the rain bands and the strong winds, we'll see the storm surge. As the surface wind blows towards the center of the storm, it pushes a dome of water underneath the storm. This can cause flooding if the storm approaches land. So let's talk about the things that cause damage in a hurricane. Of course, winds can be very dramatic. They may exceed 150 miles an hour. Several storms recently have had wind speeds above 180 miles an hour. The storm surge, that dome of water underneath the storm, may exceed 20 feet. Imagine a 20-foot flood in coastal regions. Due to the strong winds, waves may build. It's not uncommon to see 50-foot waves in and around a hurricane. Keep in mind, the wave height is added on top of the storm surge. Then, of course, there's flooding. A particularly bad storm for residents of North Carolina was Hurricane Matthew in 2016, with some areas of the state receiving over 10 inches of rain. Of course, more recently, in 2017, Hurricane Harvey devastated the Houston area. In some areas, an excess of 40 inches of rain was measured. In addition to the wind, storm surge, wave, and flooding, weak tornadoes may also be formed in, within a hurricane. Two meteorologists, Mr. Saffer and Mr. Simpson, were instrumental in developing a hurricane rating scale. Hurricanes are rated on a scale of 1 through 5. 1 is a relatively weak storm, where 5 is a severe and intense storm. Let's take a look at a few of the highlighted areas. In a Category 1 storm, we'd expect some building damage. Loose outdoor items will become projectiles in the strong winds. With a Category 2 storm, there will be considerable damage to structures like mobile homes. Glass windows in high-rise buildings will be dislodged and become airborne. That's a visual I don't want to think about. With a Category 3 storm, we will see structural damage to well-constructed homes. Many trees in the forest will be snapped and there will be long power outages for days or weeks following the storm. A Category 4 storm will see complete roof structure failures on well-built homes, virtually all signs blown down, and most trees in the forest will be snapped or uprooted. Then, the catastrophic damage of a Category 5 storm, complete building failures, some small buildings blown away, all signs blown down, nearly all windows in high-rise buildings become airborne, severe injury and death likely for any person struck by wind-blown debris. Clearly, a Category 5 hurricane is not something you want to experience. Keep in mind, most hurricane images from the ground are not very spectacular because the system is so large. I was in central North Carolina when I took this image that shows the cirrus cloud outflow from the top of the hurricane. This was hundreds of miles away as the storm was just barely at the southernmost tip of Florida. Hurricanes are very large structures and best seen through satellite imagery. Thanks for watching this video, and I hope to see you again with one of the next videos related to severe weather. Have a great day.